Welcome to The Bitter Witness. Don't be scared. (laughs) Hello. Welcome back. I'm Rebecca, and I'm your host for The Bitter Witness. I hope you've had a good week. I've had a wonderful week. Another one of my boys came home for the weekend. It's always nice when one of them comes home for a visit, but it's also just as nice when they go back. If you know, you know. I've been busy at the theater rehearsing, and our set is almost finished, and I've been given the green light to head in and start painting. I love painting sets. I'm by myself in the theater, throw my tunage on, and just start. It's a lot of work for one person, but I think it's one of the things that brings me the most joy in theater. There's something about having an entire stage that is just a blank canvas waiting for you to create a world for people to escape inside of for a few hours. I absolutely love it. That's about it for my little corner of Ontario. Let's get the business out of the way. If you enjoy this episode or any episode, please head over to the Patreon page and support the show. You can also support the show by subscribing on Spotify. As well, give the show a five-star review on whatever platform you're listening to. It helps the algorithm, which is something I will never understand. Don't forget to follow the show as well. That way, all new episodes will download to your phone automatically each week. That is, of course, if you set it up that way. That's enough of the business. The dogs are sleeping behind me, so Puppy ASMR will be brought to you by both Miley and Piper this week. So grab a cup of tea, sit back, and relax while I tell you about the case of Darlie Rotier. Filicide, the act of a parent killing their own child. This tragic act often stems from a combination of psychological disorders, overwhelming stress, and a perceived inability to cope with the demands of parenting. In many cases, the parents involved may experience a severe mental breakdown, leading them to a state where they believe that the act is a form of altruism, where they are showing mercy or protection for their child from a world in a state of constant upheaval. Such a twisted rationale reflects a haunting combination of desperation and despair, illustrating the darker aspects of human psychology. Each instance of filicide is unique and often involves a complex interplay of factors. Society grapples with understanding how someone could cross such a horrific line. According to Texas law enforcement, Darlie Routier crossed that line and coldly murdered two of her three babies. But according to Darlie and her supporters, She herself was a victim of the strange man that broke into the Rotier's home that June night in 1996. Darlie still sits on Texas's death row for women all these years later, awaiting her execution, proclaiming her innocence. Did this former cheerleader murder her two sons? The evidence will be presented today, but you will have to decide for yourself on her innocence or guilt. As always, I want to give the victims in the case top billing. Devin and Damon, I acknowledge you and I send my love to you wherever you may be. All right, let's get into this case. I remember this case well. I followed it and I remember hearing what had happened that a stranger had broken into the home and murdered two children and attacked the mother, all of whom were having a slumber party in the living room. I thought, oh my God, this is awful. What kind of fucking monster would do this? Children sleeping? I was horrified. Then a few days later, I was watching the news and they ran a video. The video consisted of Darlie, the mother who was attacked, having a birthday party for one of the children who was murdered at their grave. I remember watching this video and thinking, what? 
wait, what? That video has replayed in my head all these years. Every time I hear about another instance of filicide or it comes up in one of my readings, that fucking video has owned a space in my head since 1996. The picture of Darlie Rotier chewing bubblegum like a cow chewing cud and laughing and spraying silly string all over the graves of her two babies. The instant I saw this, I thought, oh my God, she killed her babies. And I have felt that way since then, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to do this case. But what the world wasn't shown from that video was the nearly two-hour memorial service that was held at the graves of Devon and Damon directly before the birthday celebration. We weren't shown Darley crying in agony at the loss of her boys during the memorial service. Would that have changed my mind? Maybe. But even knowing that now, I still question how a grieving mother who had just had her babies brutally murdered by a stranger, who was still at large, could switch her emotions that quickly from heartbreaking grief to laughter in party mode. I don't know if Darlie Routier stabbed her babies that night in June of 1996. If she did, she's a cold, calculating killer of the worst fucking kind. If she didn't, there has been a great injustice and Darlie has spent the last 28 years sitting on death row in Texas, waiting to be executed. Darlie Routier was born Darlie Lynn Peck on January 4, 1970, in Pennsylvania. In 1986, when she was 16, she met Darren Routier at a restaurant where Darren was the assistant manager. The two dated and were married in 1998. By 1996, the couple have three sons, Devin, who is six, Damon, who is five, and Drake, who is just seven months old. At the time of this crime, June 6, 1996, Inside the Rotier's home, we have Darren and Darlie Rotier, their three children, Devin, Damon, and Drake, and the mother of a friend of Darlie's named Helena. And Helena had been living in the house with the family for approximately two days. And if I'm not mistaken, this woman was a kind of housekeeper or helper for the Rotier family. According to the testimony in court, Helen was picked up by her daughter at about 6 p.m. on the evening of June 5, 1996. That night, the two boys, Devin and Damon, had spent the day playing in the hot tub and outside with friends since school had just let out. Damon and Devin wanted to have a slumber party in the living room. Darlie stated that she had been sleeping on the couch for a few nights already as she was a very light sleeper and she hadn't been able to get any rest because each time the baby, Drake, would move, she would wake up. Darren had put the baby down in his crib and come back down to the living room to chat with Darlie for a little before turning in himself. According to testimony, Darren and Darlie spoke about bills and their boat, Darlie was feeling depressed because, since the baby had been born, she wasn't able to go anywhere or do anything as the family only had one car at the time. The couple discussed the possibility of Darlie going away with some of her girlfriends on a trip, somewhere tropical, and then Darren turned in for the night. Darlie stated that she dozed off once Darren had gone to bed. Darren, much like Darlie, stated that he watched TV for a few minutes then shut it off and fell asleep. The next thing that happens is that Darlie is woken up by her younger son Damon pushing on her right shoulder. She says that as she came to, she remembers seeing a man heading into the utility room. The utility room was off the kitchen. She said that she could see the side of him. She could see a baseball hat. She said that she didn't know what was happening, but she felt a panic. She turned on the light and headed for the utility room. She saw a knife on the floor. She picked up the knife and placed it on the counter. She stated in an interview that at that point she started screaming for Darren. 
And then she testified that she noticed that she had blood on her, and she looked back into the living room and saw Devin and Damon laying on the floor, also covered in blood. When you look at the crime scene photos, and I don't suggest that you ever look at them, the entire living room and kitchen is saturated with blood. Darren stated that he came down and immediately started administering CPR to Devin. Darlie called 911. I think it's important that we look at the 911 call. I'm not going to play you any of the call because it's awful and it's actually quite hard to make out the words that are being said, but I do have a transcript of the call so we can go through it. And we're starting off with the 911 call because that is the first contact that Darlie Routier has with law enforcement. And the prosecutors have stated that this call is one of the items that raise suspicion against Darlie. Nine one one, roulette nine one one. What is your emergency, Darlie? Somebody came in here. They broke in. Nine one one, ma'am, Darlie. They just stabbed me and my children. Nine one one. What, Darlie? They stabbed me and my kids, my little boys. Nine one one. Who? Who did, Darlie? My little boy is dying. Nine one one. Hang on, hang on, hang on, Darlie. Hurry, nine one one. Stand by for medical emergency, Darlie. Ma'am, nine one one. Hang on, ma'am, Darlie. Ma'am, nine one one. Unknown medical emergency, fifty eight oh one Eagle Drive, Darlie. Ma'am, nine one one. Ma'am, I'm trying to get an ambulance to you. Hang on a minute, Darlie. Oh my God, my babies are dying. Nine one one. What's going on, ma'am? Darlie, oh my God, thought he was dead. Oh my God, I don't even know. Nine one one, attention nine o one, unknown medical emergency fifty eight o one. Darlie, I don't even know. Nine one one, Eagle Drive, box two thirty eight, cross route Linda Vista, North Willowbrook. Attention nine o one, medical emergency. Darlie, who was breathing? Are they still lying there? Nine one one. Maybe possibly stabbing 5801 Eagle Drive, Box 238, Cross Street, Linda Vista N, Willowbrook. Darlie, oh my God, what do we do? 911, time out 232. Darlie, oh my God, oh my God. 911, need units going towards 5801 Eagle Drive, 5801 Eagle Drive. Darlie, oh my God, my baby's dead. Damon, hold on, honey. 911, hysterical female on the phone says her child has been stabbed. Darlie, I saw them, Darren. Oh my God, came in here. 911, ma'am, I need you to calm down and talk to me. Darlie, okay, didn't you get my address? 911, 5801 Eagle. Darlie, yes, we need help. Darren, I don't know who it was. We got to find who it was. 911, ma'am, ma'am, listen, listen to me. Darlie, yes, yes, oh my God, oh my God. 911, ma'am, Darlie, yes. 911 I need you to I need you to talk to me Darlie what 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 my babies are dead do you do you want honey hold on 911 ma'am I can't understand you Darlie yes 911 you're going to have to slow down calm down and talk to me Darlie I'm talking to my babies they're dying 911 what is going on Darlie, somebody came in while I was sleeping. Me and my little boys were sleeping downstairs. Some man came in, stabbed my baby, stabbed me. I woke up. I was fighting. He ran out through the garage. They threw the knife down. My babies are dying. They're dead. Oh my God. 911. Okay. Stay on the phone with me. Darlie, oh my God. 911. What happened? Darlie, hold on, honey. Hold on. 911. Who was on? It was the white phone. Darlie, hold on. 911, they are wondering when we need to dispatch, so I sent a double team. Darlie, oh my God, oh my God. 911, okay, thanks. Darlie, oh my God, oh my God. 911, ma'am, who's there with you? Darlie, Karen. Karen is a neighbor of Darlie and Darren's. 911, ma'am, Darlie, what? 
911. Is there anyone in the house besides you and your children? Darlie, no, my husband, he just ran downstairs. He's helping me, but they're dying. Oh my God, they're dead. 911. Okay, okay. How many little boys? Is it two little boys? Darlie, there's two of them. There's two. 911. What's the cross street on the address on Eagle? Darlie, oh my God, who would do this? 911. Listen to me. Calm down. Darlie, I feel really bad. I think I'm dying. When are they going to be here? 911, 5801 Eagle Drive, 5801 Eagle Drive. Darlie, when are they going to be here? 911, going to be a stabbing. Darlie, when are they going to be here? 911, ma'am, they're on their way. Darlie, I just got to sit here forever. Oh my God, who would do this? Who would do this? 911, ma'am, how old are your boys? Darlie, what? 911, how old are your boys? Darlie, seven and five. 911, okay. Darlie, oh my God, oh my God, oh, he's dead. 911, calm down. Can you, Darlie, oh God, Devin, no, oh my God. 911, is your name Darlie? Darlie, yes. 911, this is her. Is your husband's name Darren? Darlie, yes, please hurry. They're taking forever. 911, there's nobody in your house. There was, was, you don't. Who did this? At this point, there is a police officer on the scene, and you can hear him say, Look for a rag. Darlie, they killed our babies. Police officer, lie down, okay? Just sit down. Darlie, no, no, he ran out. Uh, uh, they ran out through the garage. I was sleeping. My baby's over here, already cut. Can I? Phone is right here. Y'all, look out in the garage. Look out in the garage. They left a knife lying on... 911. There's a knife? Don't touch anything. Darlie, I already touched it and picked it up. 911. Who's out there? Is anybody out there? Darlie, I don't know. I was sleeping. 911. Okay, ma'am, listen. There's a police officer at your front door. Is your front door unlocked? Darlie, yes, ma'am, but where's the ambulance? 911. Okay. Darlie, they're barely breathing. If they don't get it here, they're going to be dead. Oh my God, they're, hurry, please hurry. 911, okay, they're, they're, police officer, what about you? 911, is 82 out on Eagle? Darlie, huh? They took, they ran, we're at Eagle, 5801 Eagle. My God, hurry. 911, 82, are you out? Police officer. Nothing's gone, Mrs. Routier. Darlie, oh my God, oh my God, why would they do this? Police officer, the problem, Mrs. Routier. 911, what'd he say? Darlie, why would they do this? I'm 911. Okay, listen, ma'am, need to, need to let the officers in the front door. Darlie, what? 911, okay, ma'am? Darlie, what, what? 911, need to let the police officers in the front door. Darlie, his knife was lying over there. I already picked it up. 911, okay, it's all right. It's okay. Darlie, God, I bet if we could have gotten the prints, maybe, maybe. 911, ma'am, hang on, hang on a second. Darlie, somebody who did it intentionally walked in here and did it. Darren, there's nothing touched. 911, okay, ma'am. Darlie, there's nothing touched. Oh my God. 911, ma'am, is the police officer there? Darlie, yes. 911, okay. Go talk to him, okay? Now, Remember, this is a young mother who has just been woken from sleep and found a man in her home and two of her children stabbed and herself stabbed as well. If she's innocent, the chaos of this call makes sense as she is a victim of a horrific crime. On the other hand, if she's guilty, she's creating the chaos, most likely to cause confusion for investigators. The total length of the 911 call is 5 minutes and 41 seconds. Let's look at some of the parts of this call. At the very beginning of the call, Darlie states that someone came in here. They broke in. They stabbed me and my children. 
This part makes me question the truthfulness of the call because she says, someone and they and me and my children. Someone. Why wouldn't she say a man? It's not such a big deal. I say that sometimes, but the me and my children statement, her priority is on herself here. Normally, when someone calls 911, you you tell the operator the worst thing first. Think about it. When you hear a 911 call and someone has been shot, the person calling usually says, someone's been shot, we need help. They don't state the minor issues first. Like, someone came in here and someone's been shot, we need help. It's very slight, but it's there. If you are this hysterical over your children being stabbed, would you start with someone came into my house, they broke in? Or would you start with, my babies have been stabbed? It's just food for thought. Then the 911 operator asked Darley who did it. Who did this? Darley doesn't answer the question at all. She completely ignores the question. And she doesn't ask for help for an ambulance at all. Now, to be fair, she is hysterical, and she might have assumed that the operator would know that she needed an ambulance. Then she says, my little boy is dying, but she's only referring to one boy. Why? What does she think is going on with the other boy? Right after that, she states that her babies are dying. The use of singular and then plural is weird, and she does it over and over again throughout the call. I'm not saying that this flipping back and forth from singular to plural makes her guilty or innocent. It just makes me question her behavior, and it makes me look at the call a little deeper. She also does another kind of flipping, which is a little odd for me. She says, you know, they're dying, and then two seconds later she says, oh my God, they're dead, or he's dead, and he's dying. It's not evidence of guilt or innocence. It's just weird. Something I noticed throughout the entire call. Every time there is a question asked of Darley, she goes into hysterics and repeats over and over, Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Now you could look at this both ways. If she's innocent, she's obviously in shock. If she's guilty, she's avoiding having to give any information to the operator by going into hysterics. At one point in the phone call, Darlie states to the 911 operator that she was fighting. The inference from this is that she was fighting with the killer. But then, when Darlie later gives her statements to the police, she states that she didn't get a good look at the man who killed her babies. But if you were fighting with him, how could you not see him? That part seems a little odd, but in court, Darlie and her defense team state that Darley actually stated that she was frightened, not that she was fighting. I have listened to this part of the 911 call a thousand times. I personally lean towards the word fighting, but you could make an argument that she used the word frightened. But personally, I don't hear it. You can decide for yourself if you choose to listen to the call. It's not a pleasant call though, so do so at your own risk. Then she finally asks for help in the call. But at the moment before she asks for help in the call, she had just told the operator that her babies are dead. But if her children are dead, then there's really no need for help, right? As well, she never asks the operator what to do for her children to keep them alive. She never tells the operator where her children are stabbed. If this happened to me, God forbid, I would be describing where the wounds are, where and if there was any blood, if I was covering the wounds with my hands or a towel, and I would be screaming, what do I do? How do I save my children? But again, that doesn't mean she's innocent or guilty. I'm just breaking down the call. As well, We all handle emergency situations differently. Some people shut down. Some people jump in and take over the situation by applying treatment. It all depends on the person. But what I got from what I heard on this call is that she's standing over the children looking at them and just screaming into the phone. That just seems weird to me, but that might be how she handles emergency situations. 
We know that Darren came down and immediately started CPR on Devin. And Darlene never tells the operator that he's doing that. I, I just find that suspicious. Throughout this entire call, you can hear that Darlie's mind is all over the place. She's not finishing her sentences, and she sounds like she is in shock, which is expected in a situation like this. But there are a couple times where she seems to have moments of clarity, and some have argued that those moments of clarity occur on points that would help a guilty person lay down their story. Darlie, at one point, tells Darren... We have to go find out who did this. She keeps telling him that they have to find them. It almost seems like she's trying to take the focus off of herself and have everyone look somewhere else. Like, we have to look over here because it wasn't me. It was someone else. Finally, she answers the operator when the operator asks, what's going on there? But in her answer, Darlie informs the operator that she was sleeping and then the attack occurred. It's funny because in a way she's giving the operator her alibi and then telling the operator what happened I was asleep and someone else stabbed my babies but because of the amount of hysteria and chaos that she has created both in the house and the call a lot of people wouldn't catch that right after this is when she says she was fighting and when the operator asks her the next question she goes back to oh my god oh my god and my babies are dead and my babies are dying now on on the flip side she could just be in a state of shock another thing that she does throughout the entire call is she takes the pitch of her voice up into the stratosphere when she is screaming oh my god and my babies are dead a lot of times when someone is lying, their voice will go into a higher pitch. You know, like, no, I didn't steal the cookies. And she does it all through this call. She asks three times, when are they going to get here? Which is totally normal for someone in a horrific situation to do. But then just under her breath and you can barely hear it but she says I gotta just sit here forever oh my god when I heard the sentence it made me think that Darlie was wanting the call to be over like she wants this part to end she keeps slipping off of her script that she's rehearsed and she's too stressed out but remember this is just my opinion and you might think it sounds totally normal for a mother to say this and there is a good argument both ways but to me, it sounds like she had a script in her mind and it isn't playing out the way she thought it was. And she's become so stressed that she just wants this call to end like, oh, I got to stay here forever. The next part of the call is really interesting to me. The operator is asking her questions and she answers some of them, but some of them she answers with hysteria and her voice goes into a really high pitched wail. But then she says, he came in here, but she corrects that pronoun and says, they came in here. And then she gives her alibi again by saying, I was sleeping. These things aren't really evidence against her. We'll get into that in a bit, but these things in the call just make me wonder and I can see how the law enforcement was suspicious. Next, she says, my babies are over there already cut. That is a really, really weird way to say that your babies have just been stabbed. I have never heard anyone say that about their child being stabbed. They've been cut. Next, she says, look in the garage, look in the garage. She's sending the police officer that's arrived and Darren through the blood splatter and getting them away from looking at her. It's like she's saying, it's not me, it's the person out there. And by sending them through the blood splatter, they're going to contaminate the crime scene. Then she says, they threw the knife down over there. Threw the knife down? Okay, one, how do you know that? Did you see them throw the knife? And why would a killer throw a knife down, especially if a mother whose children you have just killed is chasing you? 
if I had just murdered a woman's two children and she was coming after me, the last thing I would ever do is throw away my only weapon. Can you say mama bear? Not only that, but later the police will find a bloody sock on a lawn a few doors away and the blood on the sock turns out to be both Damon and Devon's blood. So what? Darlie wants us to believe here is the killer that came in and murdered the boys, sliced her throat, was chased by a mama bear, only to throw away his weapon and grabbed a sock on his way out the door, only to drop it on the ground a few houses away? That doesn't make any sense. The next point is, why would a killer in this situation leave the biggest threat alive, which in this case is Darlie? If you're going to kill people inside a house, why wouldn't you have started with Darlie and gotten the biggest threat out of the way? Why would you viciously stab the two little boys and the wounds were very, very deep, which we'll talk about later on. But why were the boys' wounds so deep and Darlie's weren't severe enough for her to even notice at first. It just doesn't make sense to me. The language she uses throughout the call seriously raises questions. None of this makes sense. The things that Darlie wants us to believe, it, it just doesn't fit. So she once again offers her alibi, she was sleeping, and then she says directly after that she picked up the knife. Here, She's offering an explanation for why her fingerprints are going to be on the knife in blood. How convenient is this? An alibi and prints on the murder weapon? All that explain away why Darlie didn't hear anything or kill her two babies. Literally inches away from her head. Then comes the most damning thing against Darlie during the 911 call. She says... The knife was laying over there and I already picked it up. God, I bet if we could have gotten the prints, maybe, maybe. Earlier in the call, she inserted the fact that there was a knife laying on the ground when she is directing the police officer to go to the garage, as that was the route of escape of the assailant. But then the 911 operator diverts attention away from the knife and tells her to go open the door for officers who are on the front porch. And Darlie goes back to saying, oh my God, they're dead. Then a few lines later, Darlie comes back to the knife and makes a statement about the prints. Wait, what? Maybe we could have gotten prints? So the killer wasn't wearing gloves? Even OJ wore gloves. How does she know that there might have been prints on that knife? Why would her mind go right to getting the prints? Maybe today, in 2024, I would say this would be a more likely statement for someone to make as true crime has reached an all-time high and there is so much general knowledge about the actual science of fingerprinting. But in 1996, no one was talking about lifting fingerprints. People were still watching ER Friends and Seinfeld the internet was still in its infancy and most people didn't even have a home computer at this point. I know I didn't. I don't think I got a computer in the house with internet until, God, I would say just before my fourth son was born and that was 2002. There weren't even that many websites in 1996. According to Google, there were only about 100,000 websites and of those, there were probably only a handful that would be able to give you the insight into fingerprinting, if any. You know, Patterson and I were just talking about this the other day. Back then, we all believed that the internet was actually one giant cable that ran along the ocean floor connecting all the countries and that the information would be sent along these cables like telephone lines and that there was a giant plug-in somewhere in every country in the world. <laughs> Oh, the 90s. That's most of what I found strange in the 911 call. And again, none of it is really evidence. It just raises your suspicion, raises questions. So now we're going to look at some of the evidence at the crime scene. 
before we do that, I just want to give you one more question to ponder over as we go through the rest of the case. At the very beginning, I told you that according to Darlie, she was a very light sleeper. In fact, so light that whenever the baby would turn in his crib, it would wake her up. And that was why she was sleeping on the couch. How in the fuck does a woman who claims to wake up at the silent turn of a seven-month-old baby sleep through a man coming into her home, walking into the very room she's sleeping in, stab her two children repeatedly, leaving one barely alive. Because one was barely alive, I assume that child was making some kind of noise. Stab her, literally slice her throat and stab her arm. And she doesn't even stir at all. (laughs) Do you smell that? I smell bullshit. Now, on the flip side, I will say that I am a terrible sleeper, and many things wake me up all the time throughout the night. And there are some nights when the tiredness catches up to me and I am dead and gone, like so gone that a nuclear explosion out of my ass would not wake me up. So that could have been that night. We don't know. I think that if your babies are screaming in pain because they are being murdered literally inches from your face, you might wake up. There was a news article once that I read that was talking about a new type of smoke detector that used the voices of the parents to wake up children in the case of a fire because research found that many people will sleep through a beep but they will recognize family voices while they're in deep sleep. And I believe, and you might not, and that's okay, but I feel that if I heard my children crying out or screaming in pain from being murdered only a few inches from my face, that I would at the very least open an eye. Something for you to ponder. Let's look at some of the evidence that was found at the crime scene. Law enforcement states that the killer gained entry into the house by way of an open window in the backyard. The screen had been cut in a T-shape. Then they claim that the screen was cut with a bread knife that was found in the rotier's knife block in the kitchen. Police state that they found fibers that are consistent with the material of the screen inside the knife block. Okay, wait a damn minute. How did the killer use a knife from inside the house to gain entry into the house and then he put the knife back in the knife block? Okay. When you look at the crime scene photo of the screen, it doesn't look like anyone climbed through it. The cut is actually perfect. The screen isn't stretched or pulled out of the track at all. The horizontal cut or the top of the T, if you like, was at the top of the window, and then you see a vertical cut right down the middle. It's not a big window. Any adult would have pulled that screen right out of the tracks had they climbed through it. Or at the very least, there would have been rounding on the sides of the screen where they went through. If you ask my opinion, I would say that someone just cut that screen and never actually went through it. Next, There was a broken wine glass found on the floor of the kitchen and a vacuum cleaner that looked like it had been thrown in a struggle and it had landed on a mat in the kitchen by the sink. Darlie's bloody footprints were found under the broken glass and under the vacuum cleaner as well, meaning her foot touched the floor before either the glass or the vacuum cleaner were placed there. They also found a lot of blood in the kitchen sink and down the drain. They found blood with water down the drain, meaning someone had ran water in the sink to get some of the blood to go down the drain. And they found indications of cleanup around the sink. The blood had been wiped with something like a cloth, like someone was trying to clean up the counter around the sink. The shirt that Darlie was wearing that night during the attack had drops of blood on the back of it and those drops of blood were determined to be from both Devon and Damon. 
The prosecution brought in a blood splatter expert who testified that they felt that those drops were indicative of cast off from a bloody knife that was in the process of being brought down over somebody's head. Meaning the drops of blood happened when Darley was holding the knife above her head and bringing it down into her son's. I've seen the crime scene photos of the blood droplets on the back of Darley's shirt. Both have small tails on them. And those tails would have been in the downward direction if the shirt was on Darlie at the time and she was in an upright position. So think of gravity. If you hold something above your head that is dripping with a liquid, think about where and how the liquid would run off of the item you're holding and how it would fall onto your shirt. It wouldn't plop in a neat, perfect circle. It would be cast off from the knife and be in motion as it landed, which is what would cause the small tail to be seen on the t-shirt. The next piece of evidence that the police used was a comparison of the degree of the wounds on Devon and Damon and the wounds on Darley. Devon's autopsy states that he had four significant sharp force injuries on his body. The first wound punctured his lung and the pulmonary artery. This stab wound is five inches deep. To give you some context, five inches is about 13 centimeters. Think of a normal standard sized paper clip. That's about an inch long. So if you were to line up five paper clips, that would be about equal to the depth of this wound. And this stab wound is described as front to back, meaning that the knife entered his body from the front. So whoever did this was standing, well, they would have to be kneeling, kneeling, probably straddling the body. The second stab wound was also in his chest, and this wound perforated his liver and was about two and a half inches long. This wound was also front to back. The third wound was on his left forearm, about three inches above the wrist, and this wound is about an eighth of an inch deep, probably a defensive wound. He probably was holding his arm up. The fourth stab wound was found on his thigh and was about an inch deep. Looking at Damon's autopsy, there are about four stab wounds altogether. The first stab wound is found in his back. The wound is approximately two inches deep and penetrates the left lung. Now you may think two inches isn't that deep, but don't forget, this wound is on a very small child. The second stab wound is also found on his back, and it measures five inches deep and penetrates his right lung. A third stab wound, also on his back, penetrated the right lung again, and this one is approximately two inches deep. The fourth stab wound on his back penetrates his right lung, his diaphragm, and his liver. That stab wound is three inches deep. And then we have Darley's wounds. Darley's neck was sliced. The doctors testified that this wound was considered superficial then, during the same testimony, they stated that the wound was two millimeters from slicing her carotid artery in her neck, which would have most likely killed her. And she did have to go undergo surgery when she arrived at the hospital. There was also a deep stab wound on her right forearm and one on her left shoulder. So she had significant wounds, but compared to the force that was used on Damon and Devon, it doesn't appear that the same force was used on Darley. There are pictures taken of Darley by the police upon her arrest, and her arms are covered in bruising, and it is quite severe. On her right arm, on the underside of her arm, there is a solid bruise from her armpit up almost to her wrist. Also on the forearm of her right arm, on the opposite side to the large bruise, there is another bruise that has what appears to be seven small cuts. These are all short cuts and there are two groupings of them. Now this is just my opinion, but those cuts almost look like finger scratches. One group has three cuts and the other group has four cuts. That's just what I would say they look like. 
She has a large bruise on her left arm. This one is darker and at her wrist and seems to run almost to the elbow. And those are all the injuries on Darlie Routier. Again, this makes me ask, why was the largest threat in the room not murdered first? As well, why are the wounds to the children so brutal and severe compared to what Darlie received? That doesn't make any sense at all. I don't see any killer sneaking into a house, tiptoeing past a sleeping adult on a couch to crouch down on a floor and brutally impale two small children without waking that adult up, then sneak over to the adult, slice their throat, stab them in the forearm and the shoulder, not deep enough to kill her, and then cause severe bruising to her arms without waking her up? That is one talented killer, I would say. The next thing that the prosecutors used against Darlie in court was her written statement that she gave to the police. I actually don't consider this written statement to hold any weight against her, and that is because Darlie was taken to the hospital and rushed into surgery for the wound to her neck. She was knocked out with anesthetic for the surgery, and the minute she woke up from anesthetic, the police removed her from the hospital and took her to the station and had her write this statement. Now, I don't know about you, but every time I've had surgery, I am out for at least two days when I come to. Hell, I barely remember the first two days after waking up from surgery. If I was asked to make a written statement about an extremely traumatic event, God only knows what I would write. I would probably come up with the most extreme story that was floating around in my foggy brain. Like the queen took me out to lunch and then we rented a limo and hung out of the top throwing cans of beer to people on the sidewalk of Vegas. Another thing about the statement that Darlie made was that it differed from Darren's written statement. But Darren was asked to write his statement at the house on the night of the murders, the minute the ambulance with his wife and child drove away. This man has just lost two of his children and watched his wife being rushed to the hospital with stab wounds. He had to have been in a state of extreme shock at the time that he wrote his statement. Personally, I would expect their statements to be a bit different. If those two stories were identical, then I would be suspicious of both Darren and Darlie for committing this horrible act. But in a trauma situation, time goes by so fast and with the amount of chaos that we know that was happening inside that home, the perspectives that both Darren and Darlie will have at the end of it all should be quite different. So for me, I just don't put a lot of weight either way to guilt or innocence in these statements. To me, they're worthless because they were both written at moments when neither Darren or Darlie would have been thinking clearly. And next we come to the biggest and most infamous piece of evidence against Darlie, the birthday party. Oh, the birthday party. Eight days after the murder would have been Devin's seventh birthday. In the news, we all saw clips of Darlie at the graveside with family members, singing happy birthday to Devin with balloons all over the grave. Darlie was laughing, joking, smacking bubblegum like a cow chewing her cud. And maybe what most people condemned her for was spraying silly string all over everything while laughing and whooping it up. She was interviewed by the news after the birthday party and she stated that, well, he wouldn't want us all to be sad down here. During a death row interview, Darlie stated that they took something that was beautiful. They took something that was so innocent and made out of love, and they turned it into something ugly. It was twisted and taken out of context, and they got the reaction they wanted, of course. Darlie states, there is not a book that tells you how to do this, how to grieve, how to handle a situation like this. We gave him the party he didn't get to have. And everything that we did was out of love. This is something no parent should ever have to do. No parent should have to bury their child. I don't know. Eight days after my child's been murdered, I don't think I would be doing any of those things. 
I might take a balloon to the grave and I might sing happy birthday very quietly while on the ground crying. But I don't think I would be smacking bubble gum like that, running around spraying silly string on everybody near me. The jury in this case only saw the birthday party. They were never shown the two hour heartfelt memorial that occurred directly before the birthday party. One juror actually said if he had seen that memorial, they might not have convicted Darlie. But they said because they only saw the birthday party, it was pretty much that that cinched the guilty verdict. I don't know. I just don't know. That birthday party irked me something bad. But we all grieve differently, I guess. Now, let's look at motive. Why would Darlie want to kill her children? They didn't have large life insurance policies on any of the children. Each child was insured for $5,000. However, there was a large life insurance policy on Darlie for about $250,000. So motive. Why would she want to kill her children? Well, she could have snapped and gone psychotic. I don't think so. She didn't sound psychotic on the phone. Not that I really know what psychotic sounds like, but to me, that wasn't the voice of a psychotic woman on the phone. But at the time of the murder, the Routiers were having some financial problems. They were two months behind on their mortgage, and Darlie was not happy. This is a diary entry from Darlie's journal on October 1st, 1995, approximately eight months before the murders. Time is getting near. Soon we will have another wonderful son. I feel him growing and he is getting so big. I have not been well for about a week now. Everything hurts and I can't seem to get over it. It's not fair to Darren and the boys, but nothing I do makes me feel any better. I really love Darren with all my heart, but sometimes I feel like I'm missing something. I don't know what it could be. I'm sure I have everything every woman could wish for. Maybe it's the excitement, things I used to do when I was younger, the thrill of not knowing, just doing whatever came up. I know I have a lot of responsibilities, but a little craziness once in a while sure wouldn't hurt. I want to grow old with Darren, but I don't want to feel as though a part of me has to die to do it. I am young and I want to feel it. Time goes too quickly not to enjoy each moment. By May 3rd of 1996, Darlie is writing in her journal her thoughts of suicide. She states that she is thinking about taking a bottle of sleeping pills and ending her life. According to her testimony, Darlie said she stopped writing and called Darren right away. She told him that she was thinking of taking the pills and that she was tired of crying. Darren left work and came home right away and the two of them had a good cry together. The next day before Darren left for work, he told her to call him if she started feeling that way again and she promised him she would. Then Darlie stated in her testimony that soon after this episode, she got her first menstrual cycle since being pregnant and started feeling better. So she and Darren chalked the suicide talk up to her hormones being out of whack from the pregnancy. According to Darlie, she never had a mental illness. And she states in an interview that you can't have a mental illness, snap, commit murder, and then snap back to normal. That's, that's not plausible, she said. To me, it sounds as if she's suffering from some postpartum depression and she's not happy because the money has dried up and the fancy lifestyle that she's used to isn't happening. In her interview from Death Row, Darlie states that people need to think about what is being said about her, that it does not fit. She states in the interview that motherhood was not something she had to do. It was something she loved to do. She states, Devin and Damon were my heart. They were what made me happy. I am convicted, but I am not a murderer. 
I did not murder my children. According to her appellate lawyer, Stephen Cooper, Darlie did not get a fair trial, and he absolutely believes that Darlie did not murder her children. Cooper has been working on Darlie's appeals for free since 1997. He states that the state used junk science, that it was ridiculous, Ridiculous that someone would take their left hand and slice their neck when they are right-handed, just to stage an injury. According to Cooper, the evidence about the knife being used to cut the screen that was taken from the house is ludicrous. He stated that the match of the fibers in the knife block to the fibers from the screen was not done scientifically. It was, in fact, just a visual comparison. He also states that Darlie's original defense team did no DNA testing of anything during the original trial. And recently it has come to light that a fingerprint was found in the Routier home on the night of the murder. And that print did not belong to Darlie or anyone else who was at the crime scene that night. The timeline, according to Cooper, does not allow Darlie enough time to commit the murders and stage the scene. According to Cooper's experts, Damon would have lived for approximately eight or nine minutes after being stabbed, but he was still alive while Darlie was on the phone with 911, meaning there is no physical way, according to Cooper, that she could have committed the killings, cut the screen, staged the sock three doors down, come back, staged the crime scene at the house, and then stabbed herself, and then called 911 while Damon was still alive. When asked what he thinks happened that night, Cooper states that his team has evidence that Darren, Darley's husband, was trying to solicit people to come and burglarize the house for an insurance job. Cooper states that Darren was never investigated because law enforcement had tunnel vision on Darley that started about five minutes after arriving at the scene, and so they just ignored Darren completely. Darley stated that she doesn't think Darren was physically involved in the killings, but she says that he was involved with some people that she didn't know about at the time of the murder. Today, Darlie sits on Texas's death row. She gets up every morning about 4.30 and does her devotions, gets ready to go into work at the prison. She states that it's important to keep her mind busy, so her work helps with that. The inmates have a garden in the prison, and Darlie loves spending time in the garden. She says it's wonderful to see the things that you plant grow, to nurture something. Darlie and Darren got divorced in 2011 and since then Darlie has found a new relationship with a man coincidentally also named Darren. I'm going to call him Darren too. Darren too wrote a letter to Darlie asking what he could do to help her prove her innocence which in turn initiated the relationship. At first the two were just pen pals but that blossomed into a relationship. Darren, too, asked Darlie to marry him, but she stated that she wanted to wait until she was exonerated so that she could share the happy event with her family and friends. However, after several months of dating, Darren, too, and Darlie decided to stop dating but still remain friends. As of this recording, an execution date has not been set for Darlie Routier. Drake, the surviving Routier child, has grown up with his father and grandparents. He has always supported his mother and believed in her innocence. At one point, Drake was diagnosed with cancer, and Darlie stated through tears that she wishes she could have been beside her son as he went through treatments. Thankfully today, Drake is cancer-free. Darlie Routier has been offered a deal by prosecutors since her conviction. If she were to plead guilty to the murders of Devon and Damon, they would take her off death row and allow her to spend the rest of her life behind bars. Darlie has refused this offer, stating that she is innocent and will continue to claim her innocence until there is justice for her sons. She states that if they choose to kill her, 
they will have to answer for that, that that will be her innocent blood on their hands. My thoughts. Did Darlie Routier murder her children and stage the scene? Before researching this case, I would have said yes, but now I just don't know. I still lean towards the yes side, but there are some very compelling pieces of evidence that make me question her guilt. Darlie would have us believe that a killer entered her home that night and brutally stabbed both of her children and sliced her throat while she slept. It is extremely rare for a killer to enter a home without a plan of attack in place, to just enter and figure out who to kill once they get inside. These are called thrill killers. But with that story, there are too many questions for my liking. How did she sleep through her boys and herself being stabbed? I don't believe it. How did her bloody footprints get underneath the glass and the vacuum cleaner? That vacuum cleaner was thrown onto the floor during a scuffle. And if she was fighting with the killer, why can't she give more of a description than he was a white man? Why were her stab wounds so much less severe than Devin and Damon's? Why would a killer allow the biggest threat in the room to remain unbound and conscious while killing two little boys so brutally right beside that threat? Too many questions. And then there is the birthday party at the grave. I know there was a two-hour memorial prior to the birthday party, but I'm telling you now, there is no way that eight days after my six-year-old was brutally murdered that I would be smacking bubblegum and spraying silly string on the headstones of my sons. If I were to celebrate a birthday of my son eight days after they were murdered, I would sing happy birthday, but I would be sobbing like an Irish mourner on top of that grave. I know that we all grieve in different ways and that we all handle death differently. But when you get right down to it, no one, and I mean no one, goes from absolute grief to silly string in eight days over the brutal murder of a six-year-old child. I guess time will tell us if Darlie is innocent or guilty. Hopefully her lawyer is able to get a new trial and have the evidence tested now that science has advanced enough. Because at the end of the day, two little boys lost out on their lives. And if it wasn't Darlie Routier who committed this horrific, tragic crime, then the real killer is free, which means there has been no justice for Devin and Damon. I want justice for Devin and Damon, but I want honest justice. If it's not Darlie, then she has been served an injustice as well. But I want to see the person who did this punished. There is testing that is being done currently in this case, and hopefully soon there may be some more answers. Whew, that was a heavy one. This case has stuck in my craw since it happened in 1996. Every time I think of a mother killing a child or I hear about it or I read about it, that image of her spraying silly string on their graves pops into my head. I'm glad I researched it though. And like I said, there are arguments for both sides. So I honestly don't know if Darlie did it. If she didn't do it, I pray that the testing gets done and they find out who the real killer was. If she did do it, then she's exactly where she needs to be. Well, with that, I think we'll leave it there for this week. Stay safe, 
get your pap tests, and enjoy your day today. This has been a Bitter Witness production.